four, three, two, one. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to All Space Considered. I'm Dr. David Reitzel, and it is Friday, April 1st. So indeed, we are having our first, well, our first April Fool's All Space Considered, so to speak. And with me, as always, is Chris Butler and Patrick So from Griffith Observatory. But we're also very lucky to have some special guests from Compton College. Professor Schwitkis and some of his students are here tonight to talk about well, a project that they've been working on. We'll get to that in just a second. As always, All Space Considered is brought to you by Griffith Observatory, the Department of Recreation and Parks, the City of Los Angeles. And um, we're very, very happy and always pleased to thank Griffith Observatory Foundation that provides us so much support for so many of the programs that we bring you. And like I said, tonight we have a special guest, Compton College STEM Club with Professor Kent Schwitkiss and um, some of his students to talk about a project they're working on. In addition, we also have Pretty Pictures with Katie and Solar System Weather. And we also have the Sky Report, uh, James Webb Space Telescope Update. Um, hopefully we'll do an update from the Lunar Planetary Science um, Conference. We'll do Out to Launch with Chris. And we'll do an in memoriam for, the, for Eugene Parker and the Parker Solar Probe. Um, so we'll talk about that as well. Uh, he did pass away and he was a very important figure in astronomy and astrophysics. So to kick things off though, first, I wanna talk about 
Um, well, let me see. I'm going to relaunch my guacamole that lets me control everything because it is frozen up on me. So let me relaunch it and I'll get right back in here. And here we go. Much better. I can now see what's going on. So the first story tonight that I want to bring you is this is the first image of the Milky Way galaxy ever taken from Andromeda. In fact, this is a, an incredible image for us to bring you here. You're the first ones to see it from Griffith Observatory. And believe it or not, this is the selfie stick that was poked out from the Milky Way in order to capture this image. And it got removed using Photoshop. Uh, Chris Butler did an amazing job to remove it so we can see what it looks like there. So just wanted to bring you that right off the bat. So don't... Uh, you know, yeah, just an amazing, amazing image of our own Milky Way. And you can see our own sun right there as the little yellow greenish dot. Yes, isn't it amazing, kitten? <laughs> so there's the selfie stick again. Um, and now another story, a star has been seen only 900 million years after the Big Bang. So that's right after the Big Bang happened. And believe it or not, it is in that reddish arc right there. If we look at the zone, zoom in on it here, Arendelle is what they've named the star. And that dotted line is what they're calling the magnification line. Those galaxies in the background here, let me get my pointer. These galaxies here are creating a gravitational lens and they're in the foreground, they're pretty close to us. But the galaxy that has that star in it, stars are located right here, is very, very, very far off in the distance, but it passes near that cluster and gets magnified. In fact, it was magnified so much, we, they believe, the researchers believe they are singing a single star. When they did their models, they had to model that galaxy cluster. And here's the range of the different models that fit. So they think this star is probably oh gosh, maybe a hundred solar masses. So a hundred times more massive than our own sun. And this is a really remarkable find to be able to find this single star. Um, you know, this is the sort of science you don't think you're gonna be able to do until we get much, much bigger telescopes. But these galaxies sort of create a new uh, lens for us. They're actually lensing that information. And as you can see right here, there is the star right above my red laser pointer. Um, and it happens to be magnified enough to see and brightened enough to see because it falls upon a line of magnification. Um, gravitational lenses are pretty messy. They don't magnify everything equally. You can see the galaxy has been put out into that arc, but that single star falls right on that magnification line, which lets us magnify it and see a single star. Now they've applied to get time with James Webb Space Telescope to get a spectrum of this and to confirm all of it but it's in nature and it seems like a pretty, pretty neat uh, result that came out just recently. So I wanted to share that with you. And now it's time to turn to our guests. So Professor Kent Schwitkes and the Astronomy, Physics and Engineering at, at Compton College and the STEM Club there. Um, welcome to All Space Considered. We're thrilled to have you as guests tonight and I can't wait to hear what you and your students have going on. Well, thank you very much for inviting us, and we're pretty excited to let you know just what we've been doing. Uh, the starting off of tonight's uh, presentation uh, by you folks actually was uh, uh, a compilation of three minutes that one of your folks did of nine hours plus of uh, videos that we took on our last balloon. So we really appreciate uh, just that input that we've gotten from you guys. So uh, if uh, so, th this is really a story of all of the things that we're doing. Um, so you know, we have a picture here of, of uh, us together of launching the balloon, and we have other activities going on as well. So. The first thing I want to do is introduce the uh, students that are going to be speaking to most of the charts tonight. Uh, I'll be doing a little bit, but mostly this is their thing. So, Arrington, would you start us off, please? You. So my uh, my student voices need to unmute themselves. Oh. This Hi, is everybody. a common. It's a, hello, it's a common problem for even us all space considered mm -hmm. veterans. We forget to unmute ourselves all the time. So welcome to the club. Hey everybody, my name is Arrington Mitchell. Uh, I'm the current uh, 
Compton STEM club pre- uh, president, and I'm a chemical engineer major at uh, Compton College. Hi, I'm Vanessa Armenta. I'm currently a Compton College student. I'm the vice president of the STEM club. I graduated in communication studies in Long Beach, CSULB and minor in public relations and currently pursuing my communica- um, my computer science degree, master's. Regina? Hi, my name is Regina Washington. I'm a current Compton College student and I'm majoring in geology and I'm minoring in computer science. I'm also a business entrepreneur. <laughs> okay, Jamie, would you? Of course. Uh, hi, my name is Jamie Alvarez, and I'm a past Compton College student and the past STEM club president. I'm currently at Cal Poly Pomona, and I'm majoring in mechanical engineering. Trey? Hi, everybody. My name is Trey Willingham. I am uh, currently a physics major at Cal Poly Pomona. I am an alumni of Compton College, and I was a former STEM club president. Now, Regina is going to roast me. You guys can see my background. It's uh, I'm old, as you can tell by the gray hairs, but uh, Regina wanted to roast me. So go and roast me. Hi. (laughs) (laughs) Always tell me they have a problem with gravity, but I told you. Just drop it. <laughs> Hi, folks. My name is Kent Schwitzkis. Switch- I'm currently a full-time professor at Compton College. I've been teaching physics, astronomy, and engineering for the past eight years. I love teaching students, allowing them to have an open mind and explore the universe with the abundance of matter and energy in many different forms. Teaching is my second gig, if you will. (laughs) I was an aeronautical engineer for Boeing and Hughes aircraft for 25 years. You would think I have physics down by now, right? Okay. I've written 45 publications with one and still, one is still in circulation. I have written over 45. That's cool, right? <clears throat> I have three degrees, one of which is a PhD, which allows me to divide gravity. In my free time, I enjoy star parties, hiking, helping other people, volunteering on and off campus, going to Joshua Tree, and conversing. <clears throat> Which. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you for the. <laughs> so, who, what is Compton College? Located in Compton, one of the oldest community colleges in the state. It started in 1927. Um, Full time, 1,400, part time, 6,000. As you can see, one of the little um, red dot is where the school is, and the other dot is where the Griffin Observatory is. The demographics, Uh, college and community college are pretty much the same as you can see in the city demographics and the school demographics. Um, Our school has two thirds Latinx, um, STEM transferees demographics. Um, They they transfer to other schools. Trey? When we speak to major points of the program, some of the more unique things about Compton College is they have a program that is set up to, you know, matriculate under the community college students into higher education. And this is done by uh, intensive mentorship and a lot of outside activities to merge the material learned in lecture so that students get more practical applications. 
such as you'll hear about the Make It Happen project where students get familiar with Arduinos and coding and sensors. You'll hear about biology projects where we have a greenhouse project. And you'll also hear about big things like the rocket, the Compton Comet, which is a 20 foot long bi-propellant rocket. And one of the more unique things about Compton College is that these are opportunities that you wouldn't find at your, they're not widely available at the regular community college. And so these are opportunities that I'm finding and I see at Cal Poly Pomona right now. And that's what, to me, made Compton unique. And you, you also, what I found out is that most of these projects have hundreds of people working on them. There's many students involved in different subsections of the rocket and everyone's putting in their work. Here, it was a, it's a small subset of us and we're working intensively with our mentors. And um, that engagement, I think, is what is really, really unique to this college. The STEM Club. It started in spring 2019 as the cover for Weather Balloon Project. Um, we have uh, organized, influenced different various projects, which we will be talking about later on. Um, um, we meet every Friday, even during intercessions. Um, COVID really like um, snapped the growth, but we're we're getting more and more members. Some historical activities that we've um, done throughout of uh, Compton STEMs history is our weather balloon or our HAB, which is our high altitude balloon. Um, the Compton Comet, as noted before, which is our 20 foot uh, liquid fueled rocket that I'll be speaking on later on in this presentation and different gravity experiments. And we're um, uh, specifically observations of the drag crisis. Other activities that um, Compton STEM Club is involved in is, for starters, the Make It Happen Project. The Make It Happen Project is a program that we started in order for um, in order for our club members to stay engaged when COVID struck us, and for us to have hand-on engagement in the um, on Zoom and hand-on and uh, engagement between the students and, and Zoom. I was a part of the first group of Make It Happen Project where we used. Arduino's, uh, Arduino kits to code um, different programs. And we actually, in part of my group, we coded a robot to actually be an alarm clock. Um, my vice president, Vanessa, was also a part of Make It Happen in the second wave. And uh, Vanessa, you wanna speak on uh, your experience in the Make It Happen project? Yeah, um, for the second one, we built a robot car, which um, we got to assemble it. And once um, we learned a little bit of um, what it does, um, we got into groups where we had to, we did a competition of who can finish a maze um, the fastest and more efficiently. Um, in that maze, there was a bridge of death, which was taken off of the Netflix program, Baking Impossible. Um, what my team did at the, at the very end, we were able to um, have like a code of anything we wanted just to make our our robot stand out a little bit. So what my team and my group did is we made the robot dance. We also have star parties throughout the year. Um, the last star party that I was personally involved in um, happened in September where we went up to Joshua Tree National Park and got to observe different um, constellations and stars and planets. And also, and I was also a presenter, and we also, as a team, manned three different telescopes um, during the observation that night. We also have um, various different rocketry projects that we've been working on um, throughout the history of the club, as noted before, and will be discussed later on in this um, presentation. And last but not least, we have biology projects. Um, we also we actually have a greenhouse. On the Compton, uh, on Compton's uh, campus, where we grow various different fruits and vegetables and plants in the greenhouse that we have. So before COVID hit, the STEM Club had a had various partnerships. One of the partnerships was with Loyola Marymount University. We tried to create a partnership with a, with them to obtain guidance on rockets, since our club was starting its own rocket. However, due to logistics, this partnership did not work. 
However, we were still able to visit their campus and sit through a design review as customers for their CubeSat. There was even an offer to use our high altitude balloon as a platform to help launch their CubeSat. But again, due to logistics, it didn't happen. Another partnership that we tried to create was with Chapman University, but due to COVID that fell through. However, we're currently working with the math and science prep and helping them launch their own balloon since they reached out and asked for advice. So the STEM club is tutoring them. So I'm going to be talking about our big project at Compton College done by the STEM club, which is the high altitude balloon. We were able to successfully launch our high altitude balloon twice, one in 2018 and 2019, in coordination with the FAA, which is the Federal Aviation Administration. During our 2018 launch, we had a few problems with our payload, but due to our power supply, uh, due to our power supply failing after an hour, our payload was only partially working. Another thing we discovered was that our spot and APRS transmitter didn't collect any data over 12 co uh, kilometers of altitude. I'll explain in a, in a later slide how we fixed these problems. Even with these hiccups, we were able to land near Victorville, which was 10 kilometers of our prediction. Now, during our 2019 launch, we still had a few hiccups with our payload, but we obtained far better data than in 2018. This could be due to the fact that our mentor, Professor Villalobos, motivated us with a trip to Benihana's for lunch if we were able to reach a certain altitude and obtain good data, which we did. Our payload worked at 90% with three hours of video footage and with most of our sensors collecting data. We, su we successfully reached an altitude of 32.2 kilometers, but it, please note, even if we reached our altitude and, and collected suffice data, we are still working to improve our balloon. So I'm going to talk a little about the 2019 launch first because it was very publicized. We appeared on channel two and I just wanna emphasize that for our 2019, just as Steve Marco uh, Morgan said, we have data, which is organized in the chart you see here at the bottom. A quick summary of what was in our payload. We had three cameras that were facing up, down and sideways that collected three hours of video footage each. We had sensors both inside and outside of the payload that were set up to have a 10 degree of freedom, which gave us 11 axes of data. We also had two transmitters in our payload, which, in, which are essentially small GPSs that tells us where our payload is. Okay, now we'll be talking about the flight simulation for 2018. For this simulation, we used the website that allowed us to predict where our balloon will fall using a few variables such as weight of the balloon and estimated temperature of the day of flight. As you can see, the simulation and our date were both very close, and our data were both very close. Um, both GPS receivers gave out similar results from beginning to end. I do want to point out certain times in our spot transmission data. At 2.25 p.m., our spot transmitter goes dark, and it takes about an hour to receive a location from it. It then shows that at 3.53 p.m., the balloon hits the ground. And then we send our retrieving group to go get the payload. Then we get another ping around 6.03 p.m. that shows the balloon was picked up. However, it stays in the same location until 6.30 p.m. The reason, that our the reason was that our retriever, Brian, got stuck out in the mountains due to fear of heat stroke. So the fire department had to go and rescue him. But thankfully, both him and our payload were safe and sound. Now I'm going to talk about um, the 2018 altitude analysis using the APRS data. I would like to point out a few things on the graph first. The yellow line represents our temperature data, the gray line represents our simulation, and the blue line that is short represents our APRS data. As you can see, the transmitter did not report anything above 12 kilometers of altitude, and it was later known that it was due to not having the proper chip. However, this didn't stop us. We created a modified version using the blue line as a guide. We said that if the balloon stayed at a constant altitude, then it could reach an altitude of 27 kilometers. Please note that this was a speculation. We also used data collected from our cameras to obtain this altitude. It was done by using Tejon Pass Highway as a pinpoint because it was something we saw through our camera. With the angle, we were able to tell our height. 
So for this slide, I will be showing the superposition of 2018 and 2019 altitude data. As you can see here, our yellow line is the 2019 altitude, which was 32.5. This was obtained due to our functioning APRS. We had a few issues with our spot, but we will describe those issues later on. Now to our orange line, which is our modification for our 2018 altitude data. As you can see, our blue line is our actual data collected and the orange is our estimate. And we estimated to have reached an altitude of 25.9. As you can see, both times the shape remained the same, which gives, gives us the credibility, credibility to our 2018 estimate altitude. Okay, I guess it's my turn to talk now. They've done so well, I wish they would continue. <clears throat> but this is our ground track for 2019. Uh, the ground track is on the right, is on the left-hand side. The predict is on the left. Uh, sorry, the the ground track is on the left-hand side, and the predict is on the right. And if you look carefully, you'll see that uh, our our the difference here is about 35 kilometers. We didn't quite match up everything, although you can see the general trend is the same in both. Uh, the the simulation that we use to get the ground track is based upon uh, current weather data, uh, the one that we like to use, uh, and it does a really good job of doing the prediction. And the one that we had to use in 2019 was not nearly so good. So uh, we had some issues there. Uh, one thing to note though, is uh, we had uh, a couple of, we got our recovery team uh, system down better uh, as mentioned before, we're trying to always find better ways of doing things. So this time we had a couple of cars going out to uh, retrieve the balloon. They were basically following it as soon as the balloon was launched. Uh, <clears throat> and as an indication of this situation, uh, it took only 30 minutes between when the balloon hit the ground and when they picked it up. Now, one of the other things that, we, that we've been alluding to is that we can make things better. And one of the things that we found out this time was uh, is basically uh, we had an issue with entanglement of our parachute lines when the balloon burst. So uh, what that meant was, is indicated on this graph here on the left-hand side. This is the ground track as reported by both the APRS radio, which requires a ground antenna. It needs to see a ground antenna similar to your cell phone. Uh, and we also, you can also see superimposed upon it, the orange dots, which are the spot, uh, which is the spot, which only goes up to 12 kilometers of altitude and then uh, turns off essentially. And it is looking for satellites. So the timeline that I wanna point out here that I wanna concentrate on is at three o'clock, the APS, APRS turns off at about three kilometers of altitude. So basically it's no longer seeing a, uh, if you will, a cell site. Uh, at four o'clock, the spot turns on. The spot turns on, but it doesn't tell us where it is. It takes another 10 minutes for the spot to, give us enough data to tell us where it is. So the ground team can find out from the control team where they should be going. Okay, so, and then, and then it took another, then there was another five minutes and the actual balloon hit the ground and we didn't see any movement. And then finally, you can see the spot reports new movement at about, you know, 10 minutes to five o'clock, uh, indicating that the balloon got picked up. Now, this is a, one of the pictures that we have of the balloon. If you recall the opening uh, credits, shall I say, or the opening video, uh, which contained the balloon bursting, um, if you look carefully at it, uh, you'll notice, uh, you know, if you played the video, you would notice that one of the boxes, which, which uh, we had for a payload, which was the bottom box, turned out to be above this box, which is has the video pointing at the balloon. And so with all this, um, uh, with all the chaos that's resulting from the balloon bursting, 
uh, somehow bottom became top and top became bottom. And we figured that that intent caused some entanglement and that can be observed in this chart on the right-hand side, which is a plot of the uh, velocity of the two, of the two campaigns. Uh, the velocity in the second campaign, the 2019, is almost twice that of the first campaign. So that's something that we want to correct in the future. Let's see. Okay, this is, as was spoken uh, about before, we took a bit of data. Um, the left-hand side is temperature, it, sorry, is pressure versus altitude. The altitude is in orange. And as you see, we, as you go up in, in altitude, the pressure decreases and it's following the power law uh, mm -hmm. expectation that we would have for an atmosphere. The other uh, plot on the right-hand side is evidence that we've actually gone into the stratosphere. So this is a plot of temperature, which is in blue, and it's also against uh, the orange, which is the altitude. So as we're going up in altitude, then as we're going through the troposphere, we're decreasing in temperature. And then right here, we're actually entering the stratosphere. And you can tell that because as we go higher, the temperature increases. Then the balloon bursts and the, re and the ultimate reverse occurs. We're falling, therefore the temperature is falling until we get into the troposphere and then the temperature starts rising again. Okay, Regina, could you tell us what we're gonna do next? Moving forward, we would like to improve the design of the high altitude balloon. First, we would like to consider using a balloon, which is a balloon and parachute liking, like a braking device most effectively used in high altitude and supersonic velocities. The balloon will decelerate, stabilize, and have more air resistance for the payload to land in an upright position. The second ideal is to increase the distance between the balloon and the parachute. Secondly, we would like to include a first aid rider in each recovery vehicle for the safety of our members, our team members. Next, we would like to record sensor data both inside and outside the payload box. Last but not least, we would like to include the light intensity and comic ray sensors in our sensory suite. I'll be speaking on the rocket um, programs that we have been doing in the Compton STEM. So we started off working on water bottle rockets, and then we started moving our way up to Estes type and predicting landing sites and um, made our way up to Alpha 5, five feet rocket. And now we're currently working on a 20 foot liquid um, bi-propellant rocket um, using the base 11 guidelines um, for, coll uh, for colleges building a rocket, and that's the guidelines we're using to build this Compton and Comet rocket. Mm -hmm. Hey, so I'm gonna to speak to this a little bit. The One of the primary goals here is to do some analysis and show our students that even with, uh, with rockets or Estes rockets or these alphas, which are five feet long and go a mile up in the atmosphere, uh, that you can do analysis on them and, and find out some interesting things. Uh, this is the initial analysis, and you might notice right away here that uh, once the propellant is all used up, we ought to have an acceleration that matches the acceleration of, of gravity, um, you know, minus 10 meters per second per second. And what we see in this, if you can read this, it's like minus 200. So there's something else going on there. And basically most of it is taken out because we haven't included uh, parallax. So as you get further away from something, it appears smaller. So when you account for that, we get a much better uh, deceleration, if you will, uh, of when the rocket has exhausted its propellant. It's still not entirely correct. As you can see here, we've got a deceleration of about 24 meters per second per second. 
uh, and that's roughly a factor of two more than what we would want. Arrington, you're muted. Sorry. So the Compton Comet is the name that we've given to the rocket that we're currently working on. Uh, some of the components of the rocket is that we're working on a simulation for the rocket where we're using the Monte Carlo system to um, differ, um, factor in different parameters and um, input our parameters as we, as we come closer to launch day to see how the um, rocket will play out and um, calculate our velocity and our descent times and our run time. Um, currently, we're working on plumbing up the rocket, so we're um, working on uh, putting in all the connecting tubes for the rocket fuel down to the rocket engine. So our current to-do list is um, continuously working on our simulation that we have bi-weekly on Wednesdays every month. Um, we're, we're, um, our next objective is to hydro test our, um, our tanks and to also uh, submerge, I mean, I'm submerged, fill, 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 fill them with liquid nitrogen so we could test um, how they would do under a cold uh, setting. And then our last but not least, we'll be working on the skin of the rocket, which is the outer shell of the rocket for the entire uh, length of the rocket. Okay, I get to talk about gravity. So I've had the pleasure of working jointly with the uh, Professor Switch gets on the gravity analysis, uh, particularly though we look to observe the drag crisis. So this, uh, this was intended so that students can experience the material as close as possible, you know, become more intimate with it by doing more hands-on things. Uh, the drag crisis, um, for those who aren't aware, it's associated with when from you have laminate to turbulent layer flow at a boundary adjacent to the object. So we have to build up. So we use a software called Tracker, which is uh, analyzes videos. And so what we did was is we analyzed objects were falling through air and then we extracted the data and plugged it into Excel. Um, this process helps students become more familiar with the, the numerical integration process and dealing with issues of parallax, as uh, Professor Swishy said, mentioned before. Um, one of the famous lines we had during our process was, uh, buildings don't move. So um, uh, now we're looking at the graphs. Uh, you have a correlation, a residual fit. Um, the equation that you saw on the last slide was actually what we use for the fit, and it's overlaid with the data. And for those who aren't familiar with the residual, it's just the difference between the data and the fit. Mm -hmm. And throughout these simulations, uh, we assume for the drag coefficient to be constant. Um, but as you can see through uh, some analysis here, you could there, we have a systematic error in our drag coefficient, um, even though we have good uh, correlation between the fit and data. So, oh, and just uh, worth mentioning, the last set of graphs are for the videos that were analyzing the beach ball. These uh, set of graphs are analyzing the medicine ball. And we see sort of the same correlation going on here on both of the graphs with the overlays, except for in this one, we did get a better fit to the position to data and also to the velocity to its, uh, the fit to the data but we still have much work to do. Okay, so yeah, the only thing I would add to that is with the beach ball, you would expect the drag crisis to occur. The medicine ball is really pretty heavy and so air resistance is gonna play much of a role. Okay, so uh, there is an, and you know, we're almost done with this. Uh, there are a number of people that have helped me uh, as we mentioned, Lorena Fonseca, who's uh, with us now, uh, has helped us a lot. Uh, Brian Johnson, I'm elevating him to a co-crazy person. 
Uh, we rode our bikes together to Boeing nearly every day, um, uh, you know, <clears throat> dodging all the errant drivers around. Um, and then we have also include, I'm also including Waldo Stakes, who is helping us with the Compton Comet. Uh, Dave Nord is currently running the Compton Comet. He's the lead so-called adult. Um, and naturally, I couldn't continue with this if uh, I didn't have a break in teaching after I stopped uh, working at Boeing and, Air and uh, Hughes Aircraft by Dean Arvinson, and of course, my PhD advisor. So uh, at this point in time, uh, if there are any questions, uh, we will, you know, we'll try to answer them. <laughs> yeah, wonderful job, first of all. Let me give well, you guys here. a round of applause. Oh. So awesome job presenting what you've been doing about launching balloons and the rockets. And also, I didn't know about the, uh, the drag crisis. That was interesting to hear about. Um, I, there were a few questions that were asked in our chat, our YouTube chat, which people, by the way, are congratulating you in there and saying, go Compton College STEM Club. So you've made some fans in the uh, YouTube chat. But folks want to know, um, when you're making the rocket, how did you make the components? Are they 3D printed? Or are they machined? How, how are those being created? Yeah, go for a tray or Arrington. Yeah, I could speak to that. Majority of our components that were used on the rocket we've gotten from surplus so uh, we have a very advantageous mentor and he likes to go out and take his places and kind of learn how to use our resources rather than having you know we don't have a very wide budget per se okay yeah well that's great to be able to have folks to provide things that you need um now are you planning on launching any more balloons that's a question i have uh yes, yes. <laughs> yes, definitely. Another balloon is in the uh, is in the making uh, uh, as we speak. We're actually getting the parameters together and starting to divvy out the job tasks and uh, uh, organize the event. So you can definitely see a high balloon in the future. Okay, great. Because uh, like yeah, I'd like to hear more about that. It'd be uh, fun, fun to see the footage from that and the data. Um, our, target, our target for that is, again, June of this year, late June. Mm, okay. So this uh -huh. year, wow. So you're really, you're, you're, that, that seems uh, difficult to do with everything that's going on in the world. But then again, when you've got a team like you have, you can get things done, which is really terrific. Um, so somebody wanted to ask, is there Compton scattering in physics? So that's a physics question. Do, do you guys know about Compton scattering? Uh, well, we don't perform it on campus, but yes, there is Compton <laughs> scattering. It's a different, uh, it's a different Compton. I forget uh, the uh, the area's name and the school are a different Compton than the Compton for Compton scattering. Okay, and I'm, I, I would suppose it's different than the Compton X-ray Observatory as well, which was probably the same Compton as the scattering. So, but you'll create a whole new famous Compton with the work that you're doing. Hopefully. Exactly. Well, folks, thank you so much for joining us tonight with this fascinating discussion on your, uh, on the project you've been doing. And also, um, I just want to compliment the roasting of Professor Schwitkin. <laughs> I thought, I thought that that was very brave to do with your professor there, but uh, it was quite funny. Um, <clears throat> so... <laughs> Uh, so, let me let me point out that uh, the the wig and the uh, and the mustache, uh, what you see now is very much shortened. Uh, I have been approached and asked if I am Santa Claus. Oh, <laughs> well, um, there's time to grow that back before that season rolls around, and uh, you might want to because it's a it could be a good look. Well, again, thank you so much for joining us tonight. And it's always wonderful to hear what local STEM clubs are doing, especially when they're you're doing things that are really shooting for the stars. You're, you're really going for it. So congratulations with your club and everything you've been doing. And, you know, keep on with the engineering and science and keep us in, informed here at All Space Considered. We'd love to know what you're doing and when you're doing it. So thank you for joining us. Thank you. On behalf of the STEM club and all its members and faculty at Thank you for the opportunity. 
You're absolutely most welcome. And uh, again, awesome job. Congratulations, everybody. Yep, fantastic. Well, now I want to show you a preview of a new planetarium show that will be coming to the Samuel Ocean Planetarium at Griffith Observatory very soon. Um, it's called Signs of Life. And well, you'll be able to reserve tickets for an upcoming preview of it soon. But let's run this video trailer first and give you a little look about what this show is all about. Okay, I'm not sure if that told the whole story of what's in the planetarium show, but then again, we want you to come to the Samuel Ocean Planetarium to see it. So now we have two tickets for the preview that's going to happen soon. Um, I'm afraid I don't have the exact date of the preview. Patrick, do you know the date of the preview? You know, I do not offhand. Unfortunately, yeah, I, I believe it's going to be either late this month or early in May. But if you're going to be in Los Angeles and you would like to win a pair of tickets to see the preview of Signs of Life in the Samuel Ocean Planetarium, all you have to do is tweet which of the first stories that I told right off the bat in this show, which of them was not true, which of them was, was an April Fool's joke. And if you can Better yet, if you can screen capture a picture of it and tweet at us, um, don't do it as a direct message. Maybe do it and put a period before you do the at all space considered. Um, and the first person to do that will win a pair of tickets. Now, if there's a tie, we might have to spin our wheel of fortune to determine to determine <laughs> who the winner is. So uh, we'll look at the timings and we'll get back to you on Twitter within a couple of days or two and we'll let you know exactly when this is. You can go to the Griffith Observatory Foundation page to find out more information about this. I don't want to misquote the date and lead you wrong. Um, you can buy tickets to this if you're a foundation member. So it's a good time to join the foundation and you could just buy tickets for the show if you don't win them tonight. Um, after they go to the foundation first, they will go on sale to the general public at a higher price than the foundation gets. And then in May, we're planning on opening this show to the general public about mid-month, if all goes well. So the rest of the public will be able to see it. So tweet at us and let us know which was the word, which, which was the, the fake story. And I see people in, uh, in, in the chat maybe giving it away, but maybe not. So anyway, <laughs> <laughs> onward and upward. So thank you so much, everybody. We want to thank our foundation and everybody that's making donations as well. We really appreciate the donations to the foundation. So Katie, are you there? I'm here. Hello. All right. Well, welcome, Katie. Mm -hmm. And I think it's time for us to take a look at some beautiful astronomical images and also um, hear about space weather. There's been some space weather going on. So can't wait to hear what the latest is. Yeah. So this first set of images are from telescope demonstrator Anthony Perkic. Um, this one is the Crocs Eye Galaxy. And then we have the great globular cluster in Hercules. Oh, yeah. Just stunning images. And beautiful stars, Alcor and Mizar. These are from Ursa Major. And lastly, from Anthony Perkic, this is Virgo M58. And then this next set of images are from Hawaii. This is actually Kilauea. Um, the red color that you see is a little bit deeper than the actual uh, naked eye view. Um, this was just taken with a Samsung S20, but it was absolutely incredible to see this in person. And you took that yourself, didn't you? Yeah, this was taken with, an, uh, with a phone, with a oh, Samsung wow. in night mode. So the, the clouds were, were a little bit fainter, but it was still such an incredible thing to see in okay. person. And the stars there were just incredible. This was also taken with a phone. This is Orion. And this is um, the pre-dawn sky. You can actually see through those tree branches, um, morning planets, Saturn, to the right of that is Mars, or I'm sorry, Venus to the right of that is Mars. And then a little bit lower to the left of Venus is uh, Saturn. 
And then this is that same tree and same day when the sun was rising. And we took a drive to Mauna Kea. So this is Mauna Kea from a distance, such a beautiful mountain. And you can see Keck up there. Um, and then these are a gorgeous cloud layer from the visitor center of Mauna Kea. And then finally, one more sunrise mm -hmm. over the ocean. This next image was taken by museum guide Philip Cultus. Uh, it's just a stunning rainbow over Griffith Park taken from Griffith Observatory. And then the moon over Mount Baldy. This one was taken by museum guide David Pinsky. He also took this with a phone. This one was an iPhone. Mm -hmm. And then this one is from, um, I believe, yes, Sicily. This is a moon halo taken with a fisheye lens. I'm sorry, that one was from Dario Di Noble and he took this one as well. And he took a, some, some, uh, a difficult journey to get this mm. image of the crescent moon. Oof. And then there was a dust storm. This is from March 15th over Europe. Um, and this dust storm came from um, the Saharas. So um, I'll just show this, this is a, uh, this happens multiple times a year in Europe, but researchers called this quite an exceptional event. And here's um, an image from Jordi Coy took this from Spain of the dust storm. And onto some space weather, our sun has been uh, pretty active. This is sunspot 2965. This was from March 15th. And this was an active sunspot um, and huge, uh, 200,000 kilometers long uh, with creating M-class solar flares. And then just recently on March 30th, there was an X-class solar flare, which caused a radio blackout. And we'll just take a look at that flare. And Earth orbiting satellites um, detected this solar flare on the 30th um, from sun's about 2975 and then there was this coronal mass ejection this huge halo um which is uh likely to arrive on uh, april 2nd is what they say so you may have seen this um instagram post or maybe something in the news this is not true um Someone posted about auroras being visible from Los Angeles tonight. So I believe this was just an April Fool's joke. And I think they said we're streaming it as well, which is not true. Yeah, someone, <laughs> someone in the chat tonight actually asked if we were streaming the aurora. So this is as close as you're going to get to seeing the aurora from Los Angeles. And I'm sorry <laughs> they played that joke on you. Yeah, but some um, beautiful auroras that I can show you. This one's from Euron Strawn from... Uh, March 14th in Sweden is where he takes these. And this is actually two videos that are not sped up. And he said um, that it was one of the most impressive sights he's ever seen. And he takes many of these videos and photos. So we can bring you just some Aurora, but these ones are from Sweden. Well, we're in Los Angeles and we saw <laughs> this. So technically we did see the Aurora in Los Angeles tonight. But and, on all space considered, yeah. and exactly. we did, and we did stream this. So I guess there were no lies. <laughs> oh um, wow! <laughs> yeah. yeah. Now, folks, um, we're, we're almost ready for the sky report with Patrick. But before we do, it was in the chat. It was pointed out that there are two opportunities to preview signs of life on April twenty fifth, um, from six thirty to nine thirty. There'll be a presentation and the building will be open. And also on May 2nd, um, from 6.30 to 9.30 will be the second preview. So um, again, tweet at us, which of the stories was false. And if you're the first one, which I kind of doubt, somebody's probably already done it by now, um, tweet at us on Twitter and we'll find out who won them. And you can, I think, probably pick which one you want to go to, but um, we'll get more information on that. So Patrick, what's up in the sky this month and uh, what is there to look at? Well, uh, this month there is a lot going on in the in the uh, sky, so let's let's get into it. Uh, we're going to take a look at the evening sky, uh, and uh, in the evening sky there are no bright planets, but uh, 
if you go out around about 10 o'clock, um, uh, kind of mid-month, uh, you can still see uh, lots of interesting constellations. Uh, to the southwest are the constellations of the winter sky that are kind of almost uh, setting over there in the west as because we're now in spring. So Orion is still visible, but setting. Uh, Gemini is a little bit higher up, and uh, the bright star Sirius, bright star in the night sky, is still visible in Canis Major. But taking center stage uh, to the south are the spring constellations, uh, namely uh, Leo the Lion, uh, which is roughly about 70 degrees above the south, uh, around about 10 p.m. Um, in the uh, evening. Its brightest star is Regulus. And then a little bit lower and to the southeast is uh, Virgo the Maiden with its bright star Spica. And then we have our spring star, which is uh, Arcturus, a reddish star that is the uh, fourth brightest star in the night sky and is the brightest star in the northern celestial hemisphere. So those are things that we can look for um, in the evening sky uh, this month. We have a treat for you, and that is the Leonid meteor shower, which occurs on the uh, night of the 21st through to the morning of the 22nd. Uh, this shower produces roughly about 18 meteors per hour. Um, in the morning, uh, the, the, the moon will rise around about 1.28 a.m. And it's a last quarter moon, and that will uh, interfere with observations of the shower. But it's, it's worth uh, looking uh, for the Leonid, uh, Leonid uh, meteor shower, which origin originates from a radiant just above the constellation uh, Lyra the Harp. Uh, look to between the north uh, east and east uh, uh, on the 21st to the 22nd, uh, and you might be rewarded with a few bright meteors and occasional fireballs from this uh, shower. Now, we don't have uh, any uh, planets in the evening, as I mentioned earlier, because they've all shifted um, to, the, um, to the west of the sun, so they all are now in the morning sky, in the early morning sky. So for those of you who uh, are, um, are awake in the early morning or go out aside uh, just before the sunrise, at roughly about an hour before the sunrise, all this month, uh, we're going to be seeing a number of planets in our sky, and they're going to make uh, some uh, movements and uh, close conjunctions. It's going to be a dance of the planets treat for this month. So we'll start uh, with three planets. Uh, we saw some of them in the, the picture that Katie showed uh, with uh, Saturn and Mars and uh, the brilliant planet Venus um, is visible in the early morning. And uh, because of our movement around uh, in our orbit around the sun and also the movement of those planets, they also move around the sky. So this is kind of, even though they're millions of miles apart, um, they actually uh, form different and beautiful configurations. So if you get up the next day, you notice that uh, Saturn and Mars are now in a close conjunction. Uh, they're roughly about uh, a moon's diameter apart. So that is uh, something that's uh, worth uh, looking for um, in the uh, next few days. And then uh, it, they're still in close conjunction uh, on the 5th um, in the early morning. And then they separate on the... Uh, on the 6th. So uh, take a look at that and uh, get your cell phones handy and take a picture if you're out each month and you can see the changes of position of those two planets. Now, in addition to these three planets, on the 16th, uh, low in the east, Jupiter emerges from the bright glare of the sun and moves into the darker part of the sky and becomes visible. And then we have uh, Saturn and Mars and, and, uh, and Venus, all these four planets are now uh, strung across the sky almost evenly. This is a great opportunity to, uh, to look at um, these uh, uh, planets in the, um, in the morning and also joining in on the fun of looking at the planets. Uh, the uh, moon on the 25th uh, is, appears below Venus and Saturn. And then on the next day, um, it's between uh, Venus and Mars. And then if we uh, look through a telescope, as uh, amateur astronomers have been doing, 
uh, we can get a glimpse of uh, some of these uh, planets. Uh, first of all, here is an image uh, taken by uh, uh, an amateur astronomer in South Africa showing Venus last month. And its phase has grown since then. Uh, that was uh, last month, it was, it was roughly uh, less than 50% uh, illuminated this month. It's uh, gonna be about 60% illuminated. This is taken in um, uh, an ultraviolet to show some of the clouds. And here is a number of pictures of the planet Mars taken in red, green, and blue and infrared. And on the left there are the uh, red, green, and blue uh, combinations that give you a nice color picture of Mars uh, showing its uh, polar cap. Uh, Jupiter, this was taken in February. So this is what Jupiter looks like. If you were to look at uh, through a telescope, moderate size, you can see the cloud bands, equatorial cloud bands, and occasionally the red spot. And of course, uh, beautiful ring planet uh, Saturn. Uh, this was taken in infrared, uh, showing the temperature that's emitted from, uh, from planet uh, Saturn. So very beautiful sight through the telescope. So going back to, to the 27th, the moon has moved just below Jupiter and Venus. And uh, we're gonna take a closer look at this area here because this is uh, coming up for a very beautiful conjunction and not to be missed. Um, I did a rendering of this and this is what it might look like if you were to go out um, early morning on the 27th. Uh, the uh, 26 day old waning crescent moon um, with its earth shine will be visible. And then above it, um, the brilliant planet Venus uh, to the right and to the left, uh, the planet Jupiter. Now, as we watch um, each uh, morning, something interesting is gonna happen between Jupiter and uh, Venus. Uh, the next day on the 28th, the moon is gone, but you notice that Jupiter and Venus are getting closer. And on the 29th, even closer. And finally, um, a very close conjunction on the 30th at the end of this month between Jupiter and Venus. This is definitely something that uh, is worth seeing and a sight not to be missed. Uh, Jupiter and Venus will be roughly about 80% um, of the full moon's diameter apart. So we're a little bit closer than smaller than the diameter of the full moon. So that's uh, really an incredible sight, uh, definitely not to be missed. So mark that down on your calendars. Okay, now what do we have this month for our lunar um, phases? Well, uh, first quarter is on the 8th, full moon is on the 16th, last quarter is on the 23rd, and new moon is on the 30th. So that's what we have this month. Uh, so definitely go out and watch the dance of the planets in the morning sky. Thank you, Patrick. Um, definitely go out and watch that dance if you're up early in the morning and watch the moon. Um, now it's time for a little update on the James Webb Space Telescope. As I reported before, they got all the mirrors aligned, and this is a picture of the even illumination on those mirrors. That's actually a selfie. That's not just a bunch of white hexagons they stuck together to look like Webb. That is illumination coming off of the telescope that they're able to see. And this is the sort of images they're now creating. That's that star we showed you before, and now you can see background galaxies. Indeed, we can zoom in there and you can see those galaxies very clearly. You see the disks of the disk galaxies. You can see one is a little bit of an S shape. Let me point that one out here. Um, right here, this one has probably a bar across the center. Um, down here, a very bright disk galaxy. And then also each of these little faint smudges is a galaxy in the background of this of this amazing, amazing image. Now, how does this compare to previous infrared telescopes? Well, the Spitzer Space Telescope was a very, very important telescope, did amazing research, mapped the sky. This is what the image looked like, and this is JWST. So the advancement here is really incredible. Um, it is performing like we, we thought it would. It's performing like we want it to perform. And it's really just, it's, it's, it's blowing me away. I find it amazing. Now, don't expect to get better resolution 
necessarily than Hubble was able to get. As you can see here, the Hubble Space Telescope resolution was about 0.1 arc second. It got a little bit better across the middle of the band here, but then in the infrared, the Hubble Space Telescope gets worse. It's, it's not a very big scope, only you know 2.6 meters. JWST starts out a little worse than Hubble right here in this part, but then rapidly continues to get just very, very sharp images, much sharper than Hubble was able to get in the infrared bands, and then finally gets a little worse. Now, you might wonder, what is resolution? What are you talking about? Well, it's the ability to tell two stars apart. How close can you pack two stars and still tell that they're different, that they're not the same star? So that angle in between, that angle called theta, is what we're measuring. That's the resolution. And that's the equation for it, 1.22 times the wavelength you're measuring it in divided by the diameter of your primary mirror. So the bigger the mirror you have, the better the resolution will be. You want that angle to be small. And the longer the wavelength, the worse your re resolution is going to be. So observing in the infrared like JWST does makes the resolution worse. That's why we needed a great big mirror to get the sort of resolutions that we're getting out of it. Now, why does this happen? It's a sort of a trick of physics when light is passed through a little hole, sort of the opening of a telescope, the light actually, well, it, it diffracts. You get these the bending waves coming out of it and you get this sort of airy disk pattern where you get a very bright spot in the middle and then concentric rings that die out and get fainter on the outside. Now, the bigger the hole is, the tinier the, the dot in the middle will be. And it's that dot in the middle that really lets you tell the two stars apart. So you can see that diffraction rings here. And there's the, the James Webb Space Telescope. Now you can see some little lines crossing here. Those are diffraction rings. You can also see some diffraction rings here in this spike, but that's not the diffraction limit of the telescope. So this telescope is providing very, very, very sharp images is really all you need to know out of that. Now here are the instruments on the web. Um, it is going to be able to observe a little bit in the visible, so you can get sort of yellowish orangish light all the way to red light, and then it gets into the infrared. So the JHKL bands are very common infrared bands to be taking images in, and these are the different cameras and spectra spectrographs that it will be able to use until you get to the much longer wavelengths down here. So this is a new realm for us to be able to observe from in space. Um, some of these wavelengths can't even make it to the ground. The, the atmosphere blocks them out. So um, that's why we go to space on this. It's a, it's a very exciting, um, exciting instrument, and we're just going to hear more and more from it. Now, the, there was a recent conference, the Lunar and Planetary Science Conference, just happened. So I'm going to bring you just a few of the highlights of what was talked about there. Um, Chinese uh, lander, the, the, the China landed on the moon um, fairly recently in 2020, and it brought back samples. And the first samples we've gotten since the Apollo and Luna missions. And the interesting thing about those samples, oops, I went forward to, the interesting thing about the samples is that what they brought back was volcanic. You can see here's where Shang'e 5 landed. The Apollo missions are in blue and the Luna missions are sort of in the magenta color. Um, the, the basalt that it brought back was about a billion years younger than the Apollo basalts. So the lava flows up there were younger than the Apollo ones. So only about a couple of billion years old. So we're learning that these large mare that you're seeing didn't all happen right at the same time. They were billions of years apart. So an interesting result from them. Of course, the Perseverance rover was a big topic of discussion there. And one of the interesting results from it had to do with the microphone that's on board. The microphone is located uh, 2.1 meters up off the ground and it's able to hear things. Um, it heard the helicopter flying around. We've played you that before, but what it also was able to hear is its own laser. So, let's see here. <laughs> did, you, did you hear that? That was actually the laser on, on Mars. It makes that noise when it vaporizes a little bit of rock. And the different wavelengths travel at different speeds as they get back to the rover. So let's hear that again with a new image. So you hear that click. That's the rock being vaporized and that sort of ringing noises as the different wavelengths of sound arrive there. And what they found was the speed of sound on Mars below about 400 hertz 
is 537 miles per hour. Above 400 hertz, 559 miles per hour. Now that compares to the 761 miles per hour that we get here on Earth. Now, and that's at sea level, of course. Now, why, why is it different? Well, Mars's atmosphere is only about 1% as thick as Earth's, so sound has more trouble going through that. It's, there's not as much medium to go through. Sound travels very fast through dense mediums. If anybody's put your ear down on a railroad track, you can hear sound from a very long distance and it travels to you quickly. Um, don't do that if there's a train. <laughs> just, just, please don't. But you can hear a train long, very, very, very far away if you've ever done that before. And of course, the latest weather at Jezero Crater um, on March 23rd, there was a high temperature of 22 degrees, a low temperature of minus 119 degrees, and it's early autumn in this location. So this isn't very pleasant. There's no air. There's no, well, there's 1% of the atmosphere of Earth, but there's no breathable air. It's almost entirely CO2. You have no protection from meteoroids or radiation in space. It's extremely cold. The, the water is frozen and buried if you want to try and drink it. There's no good habitats. It's, it's not an easy place to go live. So very hard. Now, uh, Perseverance does have a little friend along to make life a little better, however. Of course, Ingenuity, the helicopter, has had no degradation. There's nothing going wrong with it. It's flying just about as well as it did right on day one, and they just keep sending it on more and more missions. In fact, it's been scouting out um, for Perseverance to look out for sand pits. Um, we've had rovers in the past get trapped in sand pits, and we don't want to have that happen. So by scouting and marking where those sand pits are, it's actually been able to speed up the rate at which Perseverance can drive, and it's been saving a lot of time on these drives. So uh, Percy's now headed over towards um, that delta that has the deposits that maybe contain previous signs of life that was once on Mars. So very exciting there. Um, the InSight lander, the, that mission's just about over. Those solar panels did get covered with dust and there's not much hope for reviving it, but um, it did record over 1300 Mars quakes. That's the most quakes. Um, they were, most of them recorded at night. Daytime wind kind of shook everything and made it hard to pick up the daytime quakes. So that was more of a, a statistics anomaly than anything else. And uh, most of the quakes were near the lander. They weren't very strong. So it was hearing local quaking. But a couple of them were above 4.0 magnitude, which is, that's a, that's a decent shake going on on Mars. So um, very interesting results from the InSight lander. And you can see where Zhurong and Perseverance are and InSight and Curiosity and all of them. But Zhurong, what the heck is that? Well, that is actually a Chinese rover that has been on Mars cruising around. And uh, they published a paper in Nature and they said that the, the dirt, the Martian soil was more cohesive than the satellite image predicted. They thought it would be more crumbly and, and more loose, but it turns out it's holding together better and there's only a thin layer of dust on top of it. So interesting results from them. This, by the way, picture is not an artist's rendering. They dropped off a little selfie camera and then backed away from it and took this very cute picture, which I quite like. So congratulations to the Chinese rover on Mars. Um, lastly, the, I wanna update you about the HOPE probe. The HOPE probe is an in international endeavor. It was built in uh, Colorado, actually. It was launched on a Japanese rocket. It's um, being operated and controlled by the United Arab Emirates and NASA is running the deep space network that is getting the information back to Earth. So international cooperation is making this satellite at Mars bring us back some interesting data. Now, what's it doing? It's actually just looking at Mars, of course, taking pictures, but it's able to do it at a very high rate. So it's continuously monitoring Mars. So throughout the entire day, they're able to look for changes in weather patterns, dust patterns, any clouds that appear, and also monitor things like the aurora on Mars. And we, we'd seen aurora on Mars before, and we thought maybe this is a rare phenomenon and doesn't happen very often. Not true at all. They're actually seeing it quite often, but they're in discrete little locations. And it has to do with the fact Mars doesn't have a global magnetic field like we do that creates the aurora for us. Well, solar wind running into our magnetic field. Um, there, the magnetic field kind of point, pokes out of the surface in little areas. So these aurora are happening at discrete locations on Mars and we're learning more and more about it due to this little probe that was sent there with international cooperation. So very cool mission. The HOPE mission is really, you know, the impossible is possible was their motto. So that's a little roundup from the Lunar and Planetary Science meeting that just happened.
So Chris, it's time for us to go out to launch. So um, what's oh, yeah. been going on in the launch business? Uh, plenty of things and some big things. I mean, really big, bigger than a banana. Trust me, I'll explain in just a moment. Um, first things first, let's look at the international situation. Uh, the ISS is still up there in Earth orbit. We have astronauts and cosmonauts, and yes, they are working together and living together just fine up there. Uh, all is very professional. We just had three cosmonauts there in the yellow uh, arrive a few days ago and uh, they settled in very nicely. Uh, last month, you may remember, we talked about the question of ast US astronaut Mark Vandehei. Um, US astronaut was scheduled to go home uh, on a Russian spacecraft to uh, Kazakhstan to a Russian controlled facility. And the question was, is this gonna be a problem? Uh, is everybody getting along well enough for this? And the answer is, it was just fine. Uh, Mark Vandehei landed on uh, March 30 with the two cosmonauts. Uh, he's on his way uh, back home, may in fact already be back home by today. Uh, so everything with that went just fine. Um, and one of the departing cosmonauts uh, said something nice. I appreciate you can see his words here. The basic idea is that uh, people, yes, do have problems on the Earth, but on the International Space Station, they are one crew and they get along just fine. I really appreciate those nice words from the cosmonauts. Cosmonaut, and obviously we want folks to get together and continue to work together in space. And they are working. They are doing plenty of things. There have been, uh, you see here, a, a European astronaut, uh, actually a German, Matthias Maurer, uh, doing a spacewalk and placing some new equipment with an American astronaut. This follows another astronaut spacewalk by the U.S. And before that, a couple of cosmonauts, again, maintaining and improving the space station. It is very much a going concern. Um, looking at some other things now, there were, there were some interruptions in some launch services. The Russians uh, had some controversy with the OneWeb company that was scheduled to launch some satellites on a Soyuz uh, rocket in the upper right, you see a Soyuz there. That was what they were planning to do. The satellites were already loaded inside the launcher uh, and so forth, but the Russians got upset about some things and they ended up saying, no, you can't use our launch vehicle. There was a little bit of concern this might be an interruption for OneWeb. Uh, however, uh, SpaceX has stepped in and are going to launch these satellites. So the launch goes ahead. The important point is international cooperation is something we're all involved in. And if you decide you're not going to offer launch services, well, someone else will. So we really are all bound together in this. And this is a good example. The money that's gonna to go to SpaceX for this launch, well, it could have gone to the Russian launch provider. So I have a feeling that's a good incentive for uh, them to settle things down and get back into, into the international launch market. Now, here's the biggest of the news, uh, and I do mean big. Now, you may be thinking, looking at this picture, that it is the Compton Comet. It is, however, not, they're not launching things quite this big just yet, but after the presentation today, I have no doubt uh, what they're capable of. Um, this is the Artemis One Space Launch System rocket actually rolling out. This isn't computer graphics, this is real. It really happened, NASA celebrated uh, St. Patrick's Day on March 17th by rolling out this astoundingly large rocket to the launch pad to do some tests. And those tests, by the way, are going on right now. As we record this on April 1st, the tests have just begun. They're gonna last through the weekend, uh, building up to fueling the rocket, doing a simulated countdown right to T minus 33 seconds. That happens on Sunday if you wanna watch on NASA TV, but they won't actually launch it. This is to verify a wet dress rehearsal, they call it, to make sure the launch countdown procedures will work just fine. Um, now, I do want to give a sense of scale for this uh, vehicle. It's a little hard to get a sense of it. Um, here's one universal system of measurement. I said big, I mean bigger than a banana. If you look very carefully, one of those people on the launch structure, the uh, mobile launch structure is actually holding up a banana to give you a sense of how big this is. Now, of course, you can't see the entire rocket here. So let me uh, go over to another universal system of measurement, which is Griffith Observatories. For those of us in our local audience, uh, our building at Griffith Observatory, not the parking lots and grounds, just the building is 240 feet 
from east to west across this image. How big would the space launch system be if we laid it on its side there? Well, it would overhang the building on both sides, uh, going all the way from the driveway on the east side, overhanging the, uh, the restaurant and the west balcony over on the west side. So it is a truly gigantic rocket. Now, where is this rocket gonna be launching from? Uh, it is Pad 39 at Cape Canaveral. However, there are two Pad 39s. The more famous one is Pad 39A at the bottom of this image. That's where Apollo 11 launched to uh, the moon from for the first moon landing. Um, and lately, 39A has been very busy because NASA has uh, rented out that space for SpaceX. Lots of SpaceX launches, couple we'll talk about, will all be leaving from 39A. 39B is right next door. It launched the Apollo 10 dress rehearsal mission right before the moon landing in 1969 and has launched a number of other famous launches, but it hasn't been used since uh, the year 2009 for the Ares 1X launch attempt. It's a NASA uh, operated launch pad. SpaceX doesn't work out of there. So this launch, either in May or in June, we'll see when it happens, is going to occur from NASA's control pad 39B. Um, another launch I want to follow up on, uh, last time we spoke, I mentioned uh, the Astra company uh, launched its vehicle for the first time from Cape Canaveral. This small satellite launcher suffered a failure of the second stage separating properly from the first stage. It tumbled out of control and they lost the satellites who were trying to launch. That was a real shame because they were just coming off their first successful launch from their usual place, uh, Kodiak Island in Alaska, uh, where they'd made it all the way to orbit on their sixth attempt, right? So they had had a number of problems and failures before. Number six went okay from Alaska. Number seven, though, failed last time. I told you, though, don't count them out. They're going to get back on the horse and try again. And they did on March uh, 15th. They went back up to Alaska and had a successful launch to orbit. Just goes to show you, you got to keep trying. Sometimes things don't work right. Hey, we've got the gang from Compton watching this. You understand, right? That's it happens for everybody. Um, we have a mission to the International Space Station, an 11 day stay going to happen for the Axiom One crew. Axiom's a private company. They have rented a uh, SpaceX Dragon, Crew Dragon vehicle to take these four to the International Space Station. I will point out though, they're not just paying customers. The man second from left is a former space shuttle astronaut. So they do have some experience there. Another uh, launch in the SpaceX Crew Dragon. This is for NASA this time, a regular crew rotation, taking the Crew 4 group of four uh, for a 180 day, six month standard rotation to the space station. Uh, they just named their vehicle. The first people to fly on these vehicles are being allowed to name them. And they've named this one Freedom. Now that makes the fourth of the Crew Dragon vehicles. It turns out it's gonna be the last. Um, the program's not going to end, but we've got four vehicles now. You see their names there, Endeavor, Resilience, Endurance, and now Freedom. But four is enough because these vehicles can be reused. SpaceX will continue making spare parts and will support these vehicles, but four will allow us to, to work for the foreseeable future. And of course, SpaceX now wants to be moving some engineers and staff over to the new Starship program, right? So that's, that's partly why they're doing that. Now, as far as upcoming beyond that, we have got uh, the question of Artemis 1 is going to be sending a spacecraft without astronauts on a test flight around the moon. And we're looking at either May, May is still possible. I think it's more likely June that we'll be doing the big blast off to the moon. Uh, and of course, we'll keep you updated here next month when we see you on All Space Considered. That's the space update for you, Dr. Rice. Thank you, Chris. Uh, wonderful job. And I'm looking forward to seeing that SLS rocket launch. That That, is one, uh, that is one big rocket going to be very, very Bigger cool. than a banana. Yeah. So um, now recently, maybe you saw the news, there was an asteroid that ran in to Earth. Um, let's see, it was its orbit looked like this, although we hadn't seen it yet. We only saw it about two hours before it impacted Earth, so about there. And the two did indeed collide. You can see that it comes in, the little red dot, and it hit just 
east of Greenland, just north of Iceland. Nobody was there. It was probably an airburst, probably exploded in the air. Um, maybe some rocks made it down to the ground. But um, these things happen every once in a while, and we don't often see them on their way in. This one came in, this is the, the sonic data from it, the sound data, and it was about two kilotons of TNT. So that's a pretty big explosion up there in space. Now the object itself was described not quite as big as a giraffe. It was described <laughs> as about half a giraffe. Now, this, this is not the actual um, asteroid. They didn't get a picture of it like this, but asteroids do look like that. They're kind of potato-y in shape, probably. Um, pockmarked with little impact craters. And that half giraffe size is, is a couple of meters tall. Well, our own team thought, well, we could come up with something better than half a giraffe. How about an mm. Andre the Giant? And of course, there's a banana for scale with Andre the Giant, <laughs> you know how big he is. And in, just in case you didn't know it, Andre the Giant does have a posse, so always keep that in mind. He was seven foot four and 520 pounds, so you, you did not want to mess with Andre the Giant. Now, moving on to something a little more serious, um, Eugene Parker, Professor Emeritus, um, he did pass away recently. Uh, he was born back June 10th. My birthday is June 11th, so just a day before mine, although he was born on 1927. Uh, he passed away on March 15th in 2022. Now, you might you might recognize the name Parker. Well, um, he wrote a paper where he talked about and predicted that the sun should have what's called a solar wind coming off of it, that the sun was so hot and the magnetic fields couldn't contain everything that, that literally gas and particles should be streaming away from the sun. Now, some folks made fun of him and thought that couldn't be true. That's all nonsense. Well, he was proven right. We eventually did know, learn more about the solar wind. We were able to measure it and able to see it. And uh, he was the one that said that this should be out there, the dynamics of interplanetary gas and magnetic fields and the interplay of the two. So he was right about that. Now, they named the Parker Solar Probe after him while he was still alive. So this is a little bit of a rare honor. They don't generally name telescopes and observatories after folks while they're still alive. Well, unless they donate a lot of money, in which case then some, sometimes they'll do it. But the Parker Solar Probe um, was designed as a mission to go touch the sun. Okay, not the surface of the sun, but the atmosphere of the sun. And he was there to see the launch. And we can take a look Three, at that here. One, zero. Liftoff of the mighty Delta IV heavy rocket with NASA's Parker Solar Probe, a daring mission to shed light on the mysteries of our closest star, the sun. So very, very cool that he was able to see it launch. And by the way, that's NASA Director of Heliophysics, Dr. Nikki Fox standing behind him. So the, the woman in charge of NASA's study of the sun, heliophysics, sun physics. So very, very cool. And that probe has indeed gotten very close to the sun. Um, maybe not quite this close. That's a little bit of an artist rendering there, a little bit crazy how, how close they made that but it indeed has been getting closer and closer and it's been using flybys of Venus. And on the third flyby of Venus on July 11th in 2020, it pointed its infrared camera down at Venus. This is a couple of different shots as it passed by and we'll rerun it here. That's actually the surface of Venus you're seeing glowing. So that's the night side. You can see the sun emerge from behind and the night side was glowing and passing through those thick Venus clouds. And it was in the infrared bands, a lot like the James Webb Space Telescope looks at, it was able to pass through those clouds and they've matched up those dark splotches with actual features on Venus that were picked up through radar mapping. So pretty darn cool to see it in this high of resolution. Now, folks on Earth have seen through the clouds as well with infrared telescopes, but not at this sort of resolution. Now, did the Parker, Parker Solar Probe, has it measured the sun's atmosphere? Well, the answer to that is yes, it actually has. It's measured the electric field, the magnetic field. It has seen uh, debris flying past its, its detectors. And you can see here in these still images, um, it indeed is, is, you know, seeing streamers of solar wind going past there. So pretty crazy. Those are structures in the corona of the sun. That's the outer atmosphere of the sun. 
Now, the atmosphere didn't behave quite like we thought. The atmosphere was a little bit, well, kind of wobbly in a way. Let me show you here what I'm talking about. This is the boundary of the sun's atmosphere. On the inside, you're in the atmosphere, and on the outside, you're just out in that solar wind that's flying there. And the Parker Solar Probe crossed that boundary, and they knew it was inside, and then it kind of went back out, and then back in, and then went back out. So that boundary being wavy was something new that we didn't expect. Now, how do you know that you're inside the corona? Well, inside the corona, the material isn't just flowing away from the sun. It actually is stuck there. It doesn't leave. It kind of goes out and then back in, and the magnetic fields bring most of the material back in. The stuff right on the boundary is accelerated outwards as the wind. So outside the corona, the streamers are a little straighter and um, not quite as not quite as kinky back and forth, I guess. Um, now you can see here more of those streamer images and uh, the properties of the actual corona of the sun are being measured for the first time. And these are streamers um, seen right there, not from afar. We've seen them far away during solar eclipses, but we've never seen them up close like this. And this is still being analyzed. Another surprise was what's called switchbacks. You can see these S-shaped features as they go by. So these streamers, sometimes the magnetic field reverses direction and heads back towards the sun and then heads back out again. That was unexpected. We're not really sure why that's happening, but they're, they're trying to figure that out and learn how it formed. So even though Professor uh, Eugene Parker has passed on, his legacy in the Parker Solar Probe continues to explore the sun. They're gonna continue to get closer to the sun and we'll learn more and more about it. And it's quite an honor to have that spacecraft up there doing this work. So uh, we just would like to honor uh, Professor Parker with, with the Parker Solar Probe. So one, one last little story is the number of exoplanets. So planets around other stars has gone above 5,000. So I'm not gonna talk about the different types in any great detail or anything, but we have more than 5,000 exoplanets. And the Twitterverse, uh, everybody from the Planetary Society to uh, NASA, NASA Sun and Space, Phil Plate, everybody was super excited about 5,000. Wow, that's crazy. That's a lot of exoplanets, a lot of planets around other stars. Um, well, as you can see Phil here saying, turns out a few of them aren't probably planets, they're low mass stars. So Professor Plate bringing the, the truth and the science, but luckily the, the count is up to 5,009 at this point. So even if three or four aren't actually exoplanets, we're still above 5,000, which is super fun. Dr. Jesse Christensen says, guys, we did a thing. She's a, a planet hunter, by the way, she goes and finds them. What an amazing team I work with and wonderful field I work in. I still can't believe I get to explore the galaxy and find brave new worlds. And then a, a little bit later on March 28th, Earth Sky said, in case you missed it, wow, a new cosmic milestone. And she says, I did not, in fact, miss it. So and she's <laughs> celebrating there. Um, now, the reason I mentioned her is next month at All Space Considered, we have Dr. Jesse Christensen joining us at All Space Considered. So be Thank sure you, you it's going to be fantastic. Absolutely. So be sure you tune in next month to All Space Considered on the first Friday of the month. So once again, and let's see, what, what date does that actually occur? Let me get the date right. That'll be May 6th that we'll be doing this at 7.30 live on YouTube once again. So I'd like to thank once again, Patrick So, Chris Butler, uh, as always, Prof uh, Professor Schwitkiss, and also all your students that did a really fantastic job describing the wonderful projects that you're working on. It's just exciting to highlight a local college and the excitement that these students get to experience as they learn how to do engineering and also true exploration of the Earth's atmosphere and the different layers, sending up detectors and an analyzing that. It's just, it's fun for everybody to see and their excitement was felt by all of us. So thank you so much for coming and, and sharing that with us. Thank you for inviting us. Ab absolutely, it was, it was great fun. So folks, thank you for joining us at tonight's All Space Considered. We'd like to, to remind you Griffith Observatory is owned and operated by the city of LA and the Department of Recreation and Parks. And also Griffith Observatory Foundation supports us with so much of what we do. And don't forget to go on the website and check out the, uh, the upcoming previews for our brand new planetarium show, Signs of Life, that will premiere in the Samuel Ocean Planetarium. You don't want to miss it. We'll see you all next month, folks. Have a great yeah. night.